Dear visitors and guests, I uh, would like to thank you for your presence uh, to this event, the uh, History of Paul Mountain. Uh, the event is made possible by, uh, in the first place, the cooperation between Mauro Baldino and our Belgian uh, Collectors Association, David Verbe. Also, with the association and the help of uh, AMAL, our local uh, Liège uh, Collectors Association, and Ars Mechanica, who is the uh, historical department of FN Erstal uh, Manufacturer. Uh, now I'm pleased to give the word to Frank Rodans, our president of the BWA, for the opening speech of this event. Thank you. More than a week ago, Eve asked me to uh, say a little word eh, uh, to uh, announce this uh, conference. Um, I was searching for a way to get out of that eh, because I don't like to speak, uh, it's not my thing. But I didn't find any excuse, so I have to do it. As chairman of the Belgian Gun Collectors Association, it's my privilege and great honor to welcome you all to our international historical event, The Life and Work of Paul Moser. I am very pleased to say that this event has been organized in cooperation with associations AMAL and Ars Mechanica. Their help and assistance is greatly appreciated and was essential in the success of this day. We have a very special program today with great speakers and, as you will hear later, an enormous treasure of new material and info about Paul Moser, his work and achievements. Especially I wish to thank, uh, my, I wish to express my thanks to the Museum Grand Curtius for being our host today and providing us, of course, with the use of their facilities. It is the second time that my association is a guest of this fine museum. And I believe and I hope that we will have some time later at the end of the day to visit the exposition. A day like this is not an easy day to organize. There are many things to do. Finding a suitable location, Grand Tertius, perfect. Finding speakers, uh, sending invitations, advertising, catering, and so on and so on. So lots of work. But mainly it takes an idea and the right person who has the drive to go through with it and of course is willing to take the burden of the organization on his back. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, let me introduce this person, the man who has the idea, had the idea and made this day possible and who will be your moderator for the remaining of the day, Mr. Yves Curet. Thank you very much, Frank, for your uh, welcome words and nice words. Uh, now it's time to give the word to uh, Monsieur Claude Carrière, uh, Vice President of AMAO, also a famous author and editor of various arms and history publications, and also the former director of the Arms Museum of Liège, where we are now. Give him an applause, please. Thank you. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished colleagues from the various gun collecting associations, on behalf of the city of Liège and uh, of the Arms Museum of Liège, I would like to give you a warm welcome to this symposium. Uh, this uh, place where uh, we are going to work is uh, uh, was opened nine years ago and it is a conglomerate of various museums housed in the center of the city of Liège, that is the Museum of Archaeology, Glass Museum, Museum of Religious Art, uh, Museum of Decorative Arts and of course and last but not least the Arms Museum of Liège. Now this scheme or administrative scheme was resorted to for financial and administrative reasons and therefore we had very little space to exhibit the many collections we have in the Arms Museum. We have about 20,000 items in the, that museum and only a few hundreds are exhibited at the moment. But 
we are reverting, so to speak, to square number one, because we are going back to the old formula of having one single specific museum for the arms, and it will be housed in the nearby building, which you probably have noticed when coming over here, it's the Cursius Mansion. Cursius was a prominent uh, arms maker who was the main supplier of uh, the Spanish armies in the Netherlands in the early 17th century. He had built that house and we are going to transfer the weapons civilian arms this year, and that will be opened in September, military arms next year, and exotic arms and white weapons the year after. So uh, hopefully we will be able to exhibit a few thousand weapons instead of a few hundreds, which you may have the opportunity to quickly go through uh, at the end of these uh, sessions. Uh, the association called Friends of the Arms Museum of Liège was founded in 1964. Uh, I have to uh, express to you the apologies of our president, Mr. Leroy, who really couldn't be present today. And this, therefore, he asked me as vice president to welcome you and be with you as long as necessary and this of course is a great pleasure for me to, um, to assist and to um, in fact listen to the information that we are going to gather and see today. I will, I'm sure it is a great premiere for us all. Uh, now it's important also to stress the fact that Liège has a very strong Mauser collection and a Mauser connection too, which will be explained later on. Uh, I have dealt about that subject already in a former Musée d'Armes periodical, which was published in 2013. Uh, no, owing to the fact that the FN factory, which is one of the largest arms making centers in the world today and still active, was the main manufacturer of Mauser action rifles in this area, together with uh, Piper and the Manufacture d'Armes de l'État. Uh, it is worth remembering that shortly before World War I, Liège produced in one year 1,600,000 weapons. At that time, it was certainly the largest arms producing center in the world. Uh, we will deal later with the Mauser Norris collection, connection in Liège, and you probably have had the opportunity to see and to view already the prototype of the Moser Norris rifle, which we are lucky enough to have here, and it comes from the collection of a main arms making uh, industrialist called Mr. Lemille, who incidentally was the founder of the Arms Museum of Liège in 1883. You know that there are, as far as I know, only four prototypes extant in the world of this weapon, one's here, and the three others are in Fairfax, Virginia, in the National Rifle Association Museum. One of those three in the United States was submitted to obtain the patent in America. The uh, FN Moser production started in 1889 and it ended in the 1970s because of the fact that, of course, the semi automatic weapons were being generalized at the time and replacing the uh, system, the repeating system of the Moser. Uh, of course, FN did still and is 
still manufacturing hunting weapons based on the Moser action system, so it hasn't completely died out in the area. I'm going to sign off, so to speak, right now, because I don't want to interfere with the very interesting uh, papers which will be presented to you in a moment. The only thing I want to say is that uh, this is a very appropriate place to hold that symposium. Again, Mr. Yves Cuirass, uh, is should be warmly thanked for his power, <coughs> driving power and organization with some other colleagues today. And I wish you full success for this memorable day. Thank you. I am really pleased to be here and uh, I have to start with a private story. Uh, I was born and raised in a southern German city and we had lots of military actions going on after while the first, it's the second world war took place and uh, we youngsters we started to collect military items found in the woods wherever and amongst um, these uh, weapons, uh, I obtained a Sten machine gun, machine pistol. The Sten machine pistol was without magazine. However, I had a magazine from the hairstyle made Browning Grand Puissance pistol. And this magazine fitted in the magazine well of the Sten machine pistol. And my father learned me how to handle an automatic pistol with live ammunition. And so I thought, smart thing to do, to put one 9mm Luger pistol around in the magazine of the Grand Puissance and put the whole thing together with a machine pistol. And so I did, and while the bolt traveled forward, but the weapon fired, and I was totally uh, astonished. My parents had been gone, and I had a hole, 9mm of course, in the wall, in the white wall of our living room. <laughs> and thanks to God, at that time, toothpaste was plain white toothpaste without um, red or blue or whatever stripes and I took the toothpaste into the 9mm hole until it really was closed and I thought I'm head of the situation. A few hours later my father came, smelled around, smelled around and all of a sudden he st uh, stumbled over the empty case of a 9mm round because I forgot that the empty case is being ejected. And he took it up, and then I confessed my story, and I expected help to come. No, he took his arm around my shoulder and said, smart guy, very clever. And this is the beginning of my love with firearms. And at that time I had decided already, because he had a Mauser HSC pistol, um, and the Sten gun turned out to be a product of Mauser. Mauser made one, no, 10,000 Sten guns, exactly replicas of the original Sten gun. At that time I decided I have to go to Mauser. This is my dream. And it became, it became reality. So I was asked to uh, talk about the period uh, 19, uh, the 70s. And the 70s started, interesting enough, <coughs> of um, I, I joined the company and uh, I was asked to um, look after the sales, but my interest was more or less um, the mechanics, the technical developments, and my major task was to talk to the shareholder, not to sell the company. The shareholder was the Quant Group. The Quant Group uh, obtained <coughs> Uh, the wealth of this group, let's put it this way, um, started in the First World War, producing Mauser rifles, 
carbines, tank rifles, etc. And uh, in the Second World War, of course, uh, Mauser was a huge company, uh, 12,000 people working for, uh, for military purposes there. And after the war, the Grand Group decided not to be engaged anymore with uh, armament. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the Grand Group bought BMW, the, the Varta Battery Company, and it's a huge uh, conglomerate. And one of these days, I was asked by uh, Mr. Grant uh, to travel to Austria. Uh, he wanted to have a trade-off for the BMW Group um, to um, buy the Daimler Puch. This is an Austrian um, automotive and uh, motorcycle producer. And um, he wanted to have a trade-off with a Mauser company to give this company to uh, Steyr Daimler Puch and in, in refund to get the motorcycle uh, business, small business uh, from a cubic center, uh, centimeter because uh, they had um, very, very tiny little um, bicycles uh, with engines. So um, I was not very happy about this solution and um, I was very happy when I found out that the Austrians in their peace treaty of 1956 were not allowed to buy any military or civilian um, weaponry uh, from Germany. And so I saved the company from being Austrian, it's still German. Uh, what we produced at that time was, um, of course, commercial guns, uh, repeating rifles, Model 66, for instance. But um, at the same time, uh, Sam Cummings from Inder Arms, Virginia, uh, approached me and said, um, we had experience in producing the Mauser Parabellum pistol, um, DWM Parabellum pistol, I should say, to be correct and um, whether we would be prepared to reproduce this pistol for him, for the American market. And uh, we looked around and I knew that uh, the pistol was also made in Switzerland. So I started negotiation with the Swiss and we got the blueprint and uh, gauges and uh, machinery and started uh, to reproduce the Parabellum pistol. However, the blueprint was based on English industrial norm, not on the German industrial <coughs> norm, which uh, was a, a rather headache to us. But still we produced uh, uh, about 60,000 Luger pistols for Cummings, mostly. And at the same time, the government approached us and said, uh, uh, we would like to have a new infantry rifle and the requirement is it has to have a caseless ammunition. So we started to develop uh, an assault rifle with caseless ammunition and I have a, a token here and I'll let it go around. Uh, what you see here is a gummy but it's the original size and the bullet is inside, I take off this cap, and then you can touch it. The color is 4.3 by 33 millimeters. Um, the idea was <coughs> to penetrate a NATO helmet at a distance of 200 meters, and uh, this little bullet actually did it. We have been in uh, competition to Heckler and Koch. Heckler and Koch have been former engineers with the Mauser company. And uh, our idea was to have a, a three-shot burst to co accomplish the, the requirement, three-shot in a helmet, a NATO helmet, 
at 200 meters. But our solution was uh, not very competitive. The solution of HNK was much better. And in 1989, uh, the system has been approved by the German government to become the standard uh, new assault rifle. The change from the classical G3, or let me put it this way, we started off with the FN G1, and then we became um, the G3, which was a development from Moser in, in the year 1944-45, which was then um, brought up to standards by the Spanish, <clears throat> and then uh, became the first German military ordnance rifle. And uh, um, the caseless um, was supposed to replace the G3, and uh, this whole change process cost about 1.3 milliard billion billion uh, D-marks. Uh, the gun was adopted in, uh, in September 1989, and then um, the wall broke down in Berlin in December 1989, and the government said, we need the money for uh, rebuilding the German East, and uh, the G3 should stay, stood until 1994 where I, I had the pleasure to sell to the government the G336 uh, and our program, this one, what is presently being presented here, the G11 was then uh, obsolete. The G36 is our present ordnance rifle um, and um, the government has a, a new um, competition um, and uh, I understand FN is one of the competitors, Six Hour is one of the competitors, Steyr is one of the competitors, and of course H HNK Hedlund Koch could be favorite. So this roughly covers the time where I was head of uh, Mauser and head of Hedlund Koch. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and um, let me say that I'm really happy to be here today and to speak about uh, uh, Paul Maus. So, I would like to thank you, Rolf, for this uh, interesting presentation, and uh, I ask Rolf to discuss about uh, modern Mauser, just to let you understand that Mauser is still, uh, is still producing today, although there is not, let, let me say that there is no real relationship with the current Mauser and the Mauser that we are going to discuss today in our uh, presentation. So the first uh, uh, topic that I want to discuss with you is uh, uh, the Mauser archive. Why this? Because uh, there are lots of, uh, uh, let me say, legends around uh, what happened with the archive and with the documentation of Mauser at the end of Second World War. If you read m mainly all USA and Anglo-Saxon books, they are telling us that the Mauser archives were destroyed at the end of the Second World War as a result of the fact that the company was occupied by the French forces and then was dismantled starting from 1948. Is this true? And this is what we're going to discuss today. Actually, I can already introduce the fact that this is not true, but I want to be well, I want to provide to you more information about this. This is because our study uh, are mainly based upon archives and real historical fact. While I have to say that in most of the books that you can find and, uh, and you, can, uh, you can read about Mauser, there are lots of guesses made by collectors, made by historians. But uh, with our job, we try to, let's say, clean up all the legends and based our history and our uh, description about fact. So let me discuss about the uh, end of Mau Mauser in the uh, Second World War. The, in Oberdorf, we are speaking about Oberdorf. Ober Oberdorf is a small city located in Wuttenberg in the, in the middle of Black Forest. And for this small village, the war ended in the 20th of April 1945, when the French forces entered in Oberdorf 
The Commandant Michon, the Major Michon, was uh, at that point uh, occupying Mauser. You can see here his signature. Yeah, this one is one of the documents available in the Mauser archive. So you know that uh, Germany was divided up several nations, uh, several let's say area of influence, and Württemberg was under control of the French forces. Okay, and uh, the headquarter was in uh, in the in the city of Baden. So you have to keep in mind that the 20th of April, the French enter in Oberdorf, and uh, they need Mauser. They need Mauser to uh, let's say start again filling the, uh, the uh, French army that in that period in terms of armament was very poor. And in fact, from this document here, you can notice that they start again the production and the French control in Mauser starting from June 1945. Okay, so from April to June there was just set up of all uh, company again, restructuring the, orga the organigram and so on, and in June they start again produ producing gun. At this point, there was a problem. Yeah? There was many two problems the French have with this. Uh, there was two inter-allied agreements that uh, uh, state that it was not possible to uh, produce weapons in Germany in that period, yeah? of course, at the end of the Second World War. And the second is that all the companies that were somehow tied with the old Nazi, Nazi government have to be shut down, have to be destroyed. Yeah? So the French have to face this problem. So the General Koenig, Koenig, that was at that period the responsible of the French government in Württemberg, says, okay, we have to, to shut down Mauser. Yeah? But before doing this, they say, okay, we want to continue producing Mauser rifle, Mauser pistol, machine gun, and so on. So they decide to pack all this and to move in Châtellerault in France, yeah, just a few kilometers far from the German borderline, in order to carry on the production. <coughs> And uh, what happened that is in uh, 1948, the company started to be uh, destroyed, okay? This one are photo from the Mauser archive, and uh, uh, I guess this one is one of the first time that we see this photo, because usually uh, a similar photo is visible, is available in mainly all books about uh, Mauser, uh, but it's taken from another, another point of view, yeah? So uh, let's say the French start destroying Mauser, but of course, they destroy not completely the factory, but only the most, let's say, visible part of the company. Yeah? And then they leave lots of uh, uh, facilities that are still today available in, uh, in Oberdorf. Okay? This is mainly uh, what happened in, uh, in 48. So what happened to the archive? Yeah? Because now the, the question is, uh, all this documentation about Mauser that make us, make us as a collector crazy about uh, serial number, production date, and so on. What happened to these documents? Most of these documents were saved by locals, engineers, workers, in different houses in Oberdorf. Okay? So the documents were still there, but spread in several, in several locations. Yeah? And then we lost mainly the, the, the trace of these, of these documents. And uh, um, what happened is that in 1948, um, Mauser was dismantled. In '53, Mauser was uh, uh, liquidated. And in 1955, because of the new uh, German army, uh, it was necessary to arm again the uh, German army. Uh, let's say Mauser was again set up in two different uh, uh, companies and, and something happened because one of the main person in the Mauser history, that is August Weiss, was uh, uh, requested to find, to, to try to do a, uh, let's say, uh, to see the status of the archive, where, where we are with, with the archive now, okay? And, uh, and August Weiss, why August Weiss is famous, I open just a short uh, bracket, um, parenthesis. This guy, August Weiss, was the main, um, let's say, uh, actor after Georg Lüger about the Parabellum production, okay? Starting from 1930, when it was decided to move the production line of the Lüger Parabellum from DWM Berlin to Oberdorf, uh, in, uh, in Wuttenberg, August Weiss followed this move and was appointed as uh, responsible for all small arms production in Mauser. Okay? And this guy so was dealing with Parabellum, C96, uh, model uh, 1910, 1914, and so on. This guy was also responsible of all small arms production under French control. Yeah? So he ended his activity 
in Mauser in 48. So in 55, it was requested to, uh, to do a study and see where we are in terms of documents. And guess what? This document is 13 pages, and we can say that in 1955, the, almost the entire Mauser archive was still available. Okay? So uh, this is good, because we know now that it's not true that the French destroyed the Mauser archive. So in 1955, the Mauser archive was still there. So what happened then to the Mauser archive? And who was the main, let's say, responsible for the destruction of these documents? And guess what? It was Mauser itself. Because in those days, there was no concept to keep the heritage of a company, like we have now with the fan uh, as Mechanica and so on. So these old documents, we don't need anymore. We need space. Let's destroy them. And this is what happened. So a huge amount of documents yeah, were okay. destroyed by Mauser itself. And there are three main key persons that, uh, uh, let's say, save part of this material. This is what they call the first generation of Mauser Archive uh, students or Mauser Archive experts. These three guys are, these three gentlemen are Walter Schmidt, Lokoven, and John Speed. Two of them, two of them Walter Schmidt and Lokoven, passed away a few years ago. Okay? John Speed is still uh, with us, he's a very good friend of us, and uh, is uh, really one of the most expert guys in, uh, um, in, uh, in the Mauser uh, area. And uh, then there is uh, what I call the second generation of people dealing with these documents. And I'm part of this because I had the opportunity to acquire a big amount of documents from uh, the Schmidt family, from the uh, Lokoven family, and also from uh, Pedro Mauser, that is one of the nephew, 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 let's say, of uh, Willem Mauser, that is uh, the brother of Paul, that was the uh, let's say, founder of, of the company. Yeah? So now, what we're going to discuss in the next few minutes is just introducing to you what we have in the archive and in which way we study these documents. Okay? So one of the most interesting documents is available in the archive are the Paul Mauser private diaries. These documents are incredible, let's say, uh, source of information because Paul Mauser writes about his day-by-day -day activity, yeah? from uh, discussing about contract, uh, design of guns, personal issue, and so on. What you see here is a very nice part, very nice page. For any reason, one day Paul Mauser recall when he started working for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, the Royal Factory in, uh, in Oberdorf. Yeah? And he said, I started working just after Easter in 1852. In those days, Paul Mauser was 14 years old. Yeah? So he started as an apprentice in the laboratory, in the workshop where his father, Andreas, was working. And then you see there are plenty of useful information in the diaries. And I would like now to ask uh, uh, Gerben, that is my uh, say, uh, co-author, and uh, um, also a very expert with, uh, uh, with Paul Mauser, because you notice that the calligraphy of Paul Mauser is not very, very sorry, is not very easy to uh, to understand. Yeah, so he spent quite a number of nights in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, translating the diaries from the old German to the modern German, and then into English. Um, yeah, when we first got the documents uh, in our hands, uh, the first step was to digitize them. So I could work with digital copies of the documents, so we, do, we didn't have to touch the original documents, which is, let's say, the first step of preservation and, uh, and research. Um, digital copies also help because when you have them on your screen, you can zoom in and zoom out and you can rotate and do things to them that you shouldn't do to the uh, original documents. Um, as Mao explained, the, the diaries of Paul Mao are handwritten and they are his own notes. So the only person who had to interpret them was Paul Mao himself. And you can see that by the handwriting. It is quick, it is to the point, uh, it is short. And uh, it is, as a result, very, very, very difficult to read and to interpret. Um, so when we started looking at the material, going through the material, we had to find ways to, to let's say, decipher Paul Mao's handwriting. And uh, basically what we did was zoom into the short words 
And uh, what I did was I created a sort of a roadmap uh, a translation of the, 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 the words and the individual letters that we managed to decipher. Um, so we had a sort of a reference that could be used to decipher the rest of the, of the handwriting. And it's very interesting to see that at first it's difficult to read, but the more you do it, your, your, your brain gets used to it and it becomes a lot easier. But uh, a lot of work uh, had to be done really word by word and uh, there were some quite some challenges because um, Paul Mauser was writing in Old German and technical terms in Old German cannot be uh, compared to technical terms that they use today. Um, but what was quite interesting is that uh, in certain ways Old German and Old Dutch are very close to each other. So, uh, being a Dutch native speaker helped me to, to interpret the, 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 uh, the wording that Paul Mauser used in a number of cases, which was also interesting. Um, so with the, 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 the small notes in hand and, and all the reference material and the, the, the let's say, translation roadmaps that, that I created, we were able to slowly start reading Paul Mauser's handwriting. And, uh, it became interesting cooperation. As I would translate uh, Paul Mauser's handwriting into German, and then I would translate the German into readable English. I would send them off to Mauro, and Mauro would keep, let's say, a sort of um, main document where all the information came together. And with all that information together, we could start cross-referencing uh, times, dates, words, names, people. So uh, that worked quite well and what formed the basis of uh, uh, the Paul Mauser document. Um, nice anecdote about uh, the handwriting of Paul Mauser. Um, you can see what this one he wrote in ink, which is okay. Uh, several times he was on the road traveling and he only had a pencil. And his pencil handwriting was even worse than his ink handwriting. And there was a page that he had written very quickly while he was in the field and it was completely indecipherable. So, and, and I studied and I tried and I looked and I translated and I couldn't work it out and got so frustrated that I thought, well, I'll just skip it and I'll come back to this page on a later date. And then I turned the page and I saw that he had rewritten the same page because he couldn't read it himself either. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bit of a shock and a time saver in the end. Um, Back to Mauro, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so um, we discussed about the diaries that are one of the most uh, uh, interesting documents, uh, uh, among others, that we're going to discuss now. Another interesting document is this address book of Paul Mauser. <coughs> Using this document, it was possible to understand all, let's say, all, not all, but most of the relationship with other personalities. Uh, of course, Paul Mauser was, and uh, we will discuss this afterward, a very important person already when he was alive. Okay? So he had contact with the Kaiser, with uh, Abdul Hamid II, that was the Ottoman uh, uh, Sultan, uh, with different kings all over the world, and so And that this information and this relationship are kept in his uh, uh, address book. Letters. There is a bunch, important number of. Uh, letters that Paul Mauser wrote uh, uh, to different personalities that receive as well from different personalities. So all this material has been, has been uh, as uh, mentioned by Gerben, has been uh, uh, digitalized and, uh, and translated into uh, English. Uh, then we have personal accounting books and administrat ad administrative documents. Uh, so Paul Mauser was used to keep trace of each single uh, mark he, was, uh, he spent. So we have different documents that are telling us in which way Mauser spent his money for himself and for the company. Yeah? This one is also very uh, interesting. We have telegrams. Yeah? In those days the telegrams are for now, today, the emails. Yeah? There are a huge amount of telegrams available uh, sent by Mauser to different uh, uh, let's say location where the Mauser, uh, let's say, representative and colleagues work around the world, and also a uh, telegram from, uh, let's say, uh, different people spread around the world to uh, Mauser himself. 
Then we have notes. Uh, notes personally are one of the documents that I like more. Uh, of course, I'm a firearm enthusiast. So when I see uh, when I see uh, Paul Mauser here describing uh, some mechanism of the 1912 uh, pistol, that it is very rare nowadays because just a few were made. But this one is something that for me is very um, very important. And what is also nice is that. Paul Mauser likes his signature. You can find his signature all over. Yeah? He's signing every kind of document, Paul Mauser. Okay? And it's also good because you can realize that he was writing down something about these mechanics, and then some, something else popped up in his mind and took note about something you have to do for a different topic and so on. So it's very nice to also understand the personality of this, of this man. And then there are rapports, for example, they are just uh, notes uh, from a two Mauser, and what this is, I, I select this one because you can see here Parabellum. Okay, why Parabellum? This is really way before that Parabellum was made, but you know that Parabellum was the telex uh, address of DWM, yeah? so it means that this note is a telegram <coughs> that goes to Berlin, and the address is Parabellum. Yeah? Parabellum, you know, is uh, the the uh, motto for uh, prepare the war, yeah, and was used by DWM as a telex address. Then we have patents. Patents is okay. Uh, Paul Mauser spent his life patenting uh, uh, new uh, invention and also checking that uh, nobody else is infringing his patents. And he worked mainly with two uh, persons here, two people, Karl Burchard and Mr. Cold. Uh, they were the lawyers that work with Paul Mauser about uh, uh, patent management. Then we have blueprints and drawings. These ones are also very, very interesting. What you see uh, on top is the first C96 drawing made by uh, Frederick Dole. It was one of the strict collaborators of Paul Mauser. And in here you see another drawings prepared for the patent of the C0608 pistol. Yeah? Just to highlight this pistol, one of these pistols, if you want to have, yeah, is for sale for only $50,000. Just to highlight you the price of this, of this pistol nowadays. Uh, then we have production, calculation, and sales books. This one are very, very interesting because, for example, for the production and calculation book, we can fully understand how Mauser was able to estimate the cost of a gun. Yeah? Each single step of the production was taken into account, each single cost. And what's very, very interesting is that for each single step in the production, there is the responsible. So we can really tell you for each of your gun in a certain <coughs> period who was in charge of what. And this is very, very uh, interesting. And then we have also the sales book here. There are huge books, very uh, uh, heavy, around, I would say, 10 kilos each, where every day, the clerks were used to write down what was sold and what they have to pay Mauser for different activities. We will use this during our presentation. Then, this is very interesting, glass plates. Paul Mauser introduced in Mauser the photography in the early days of this technology. When this technology was available, Paul Mauser decided to introduce this in Mauser. Why Paul Mauser did so? Paul Mauser did so mainly for configuration control. Okay, so uh, in those days, of course, there was no uh, configuration control tool like we have nowadays. But the idea was to use the photo to take and to uh, control the different step of the production. Of course, we have photos of different also uh, topics, like this one, for example. And this one are glass plates. They are photographed the, with the old machine, let's say, that the, the outcome of this is a plate of glass with a negative. And then what we did is that we uh, put with the software in positive. And then you can see what it's about. Yeah? This one is one of the rooms in the Sweden bow. And uh, we will discuss about uh, afterward about the different facility on Oberhof. And in the Sweden bow, you have the production of the C96. And the details are so important that you can read the hour of this watch at the end. And you can realize that around the watch, there are two C96 carbine. 
incredible. Yeah? It's very, very interesting. So this one are also very, very cool uh, documents. Then we have serial number books and shipping documents. This one are, let's say, less exciting as a document, but there is one point that I would like to highlight because people, when is contacting me, German Andergan, is writing mail like, I have the C96 serial number, can you tell me when it's been produced? I have a K98 with this serial number, can you tell me what has been produced? No, we cannot tell you when it has been produced because we don't have any production book available. The only production book available that we have is thank you to Wolf Miller, are the one from the 7080 production. Okay? For all the rest, we don't have. What we guess, but it's only a guess, yeah, is that uh, there was no interest for Mauser to keep these documents. Yeah? In the end, uh, Paul Mauser was just interested in the amount of guns, but not in the serial number. Because, because in these old days, there was no legal restriction for this. Now we have to legalize the serial number and so on. In those days, maybe there was not this need, but anyhow, the fact is that we don't have any serial number production book. Okay? And then books, as I told you already, Paul Mauser was a very important person already when he was alive. So there are several books that have been written when Paul Mauser was still alive. We have, we have a book about Willem Mauser and the Gewehr Model 71 that, as you know, is the first uh, rifle in service for the German forces in 1871. And, and this book is the Okay, this book is uh, uh, highlighting one of the most important aspects for the Mauser family. The fact that uh, because of the, let's say, uh, there was a big debate who was the main actor in the production of the Model 71. Paul Mauser or Willem Mauser? Seems a joke, but this is not true because the, starting from that period, the family is split in two families, which no connection anymore. One family, Paul Mauser and so on and so on, stay in Oberdorf. And uh, the son of Willem Mauser, because Willem Mauser passed away quite young, 48 years old, but the son of Paul, Paul, uh, Willem Mauser decided to move away, to go in coal, and to set up another company. And guess what? The motto of this company was Para Pacem. Yeah, remember, before it was Parabellum, just to highlight that I don't want to, do, to have anything to do anymore with guns, okay? This one is what happened to the two family, and uh, and then uh, Alfon Mauser, okay, the, 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 the other, uh, let's say, the, the last person that I know is coming from this family, is this Pedro Mauser, while the last son of uh, uh, Paul Mauser, Alex Mauser, passed away in the 60s, I guess, around the 60s, okay? And now, let's say, uh, where we use these documents, yeah? in which way we can now uh, cross, uh, uh, let's say, um, cross-correlate the information. Uh, this is quite interesting. What we have in the left is, is a letter wrote by Paul Mauser to the Kaiser Wilhelm II. Better, not to the Kaiser Wilhelm II, because Paul Mauser was not authorized to write to the, to the Kaiser himself, but uh, uh, it wrote to the wing adjutant of uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, Count Vol Morke, you see here the name. And this letter is about the fact, is asking the, the, the wing adjutant if the Kaiser is happy with this uh, new rifle Paul Mauser designed for him. Okay? You have to keep in mind that the, the Kaiser Wilhelm II had one arm that was uh, not in use, eh? it was uh, not, not in order. Yeah? And for this reason, uh, it was not easy to, uh, to customize uh, and produce gun for, for the Kaiser himself. So what happens is that we have the letter in the archive, we have the photo, and there is also in the same book the, the note where uh, the company sell to the Kaiserin, uh, to the wife of the Kaiser, as, 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 a, as a gift to, to the Kaiser, this rifle. Yeah? This one is just an example how you can cross-correlate this kind of information. This one is also an interesting example for people that is familiar with C96. What you see in the top the left is uh, one of the uh, Turkish contract, better, not Turkish, Ottoman contract for C96. It's characterized by the fact that all, no, uh, all numbers are in Arabic style. And um, 
what you have on the bottom is a very uh, cool uh, document that has been presented by um, Uzni Bey. Bey is not the family name, but it's like is a honorific status in um, in the old Ottoman Empire, like Pasha and so on. It was Uzni Bey was the leader of the Ottoman uh, Ottoman uh, um, let's say committee in Germany. And uh, when Paul Mauser was uh, 70 years old in 1908. He gave this uh, document where he's highlighting the long relationship between the Ottoman uh, uh, Empire and Mauser, telling that Mauser produced more than one million rifles for the Ottoman uh, uh, for the Ottoman Empire. Then you have a letter, uh, sorry, a, a document where we can see the face of this man. Usni Bey is the the Turkish guy in in the middle. The other two are two Mauser managers. Uh, and uh, and then you have also a medal, and this medal has been presented to Paul Mauser for commemorating the intronization of the uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid II. I guess, okay, sorry, yeah, back. Okay, these one are also interesting documents. I don't know if you are familiar with General Ville. General Ville, uh, General Ville was very was a very important officer uh, in that period was one of the uh, reference for uh, uh, small and in general for uh, the new semi-automatic guns in that period. We have in the archive the two booklets that uh, Ville uh, wrote, but what is very interesting is that uh, we found out the address of uh, the General Ville in the uh, address book of Paul Mauser, and we also traced down when the General Ville bought his first C-96. Yeah? So it's quite interesting data. This one is also very cool. Uh, on the left, glass plates. This one is the uh, carabine, cavalry carabine number one. It was tested by the Kaiser William II in August 1886. After the test, this gun received an inscription, hold me in honor, yeah, something like this, and the gun today. Okay, so this gun is a, a USA collection. So we have the original glass plates taken in those days. And that's all. Yeah, just to highlight how we can use these documents for uh, building and, uh, uh, let's say, better understanding the uh, Mauser, uh, let's say, history. 